Hello, and welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Timothy Revel in New York. And I'm Christy Taylor, also in New York. This week on the show, we score up the climate wins and some flops from the first week of this year's International Summit. There's a new drug that may save lives in the ongoing crisis of opioid overdoses. And how an African bird befriends humans to help us hunt honey. Plus, there's a new hedgehog. A new hedgehog! But first, we are tuning into the world of quantum computing where IBM has unveiled two new devices called Condor and Heron. One is the largest quantum computer the company has made to date, and the other is the most error-free chip. Carmela Padovich callahan is here to tell us what makes these new additions to IBM's fleet different from what we've seen from the company before and what it can tell us about the next stage of quantum computing. Hi, Carmela. Hello. OK, so we've got these two different chips. Let's start with Condor. That's the one that's special for being particularly large. Why is it such a big achievement? Yeah, so there are two chips that have two different claims to fame. And to understand what those are, we should sort of go back on some quantum computing fundamentals. So where conventional computers work with bits, which are sort of like tiny on and off zero one switches, quantum computers work with quantum bits or qubits. And these have many more states than just on and off. The more qubits you have, the more complex the calculations that you can do are. And this is where Condor comes in. It has 1,121 qubits, and it's only the second ever quantum computer to have more than 1,000 qubits. The first one was made by a California-based startup called Atom Computing, and that one had 1,180 qubits, so only 59 more. But for comparison, we should mention the previous record holder for the biggest quantum computer, and that was IBM's chip called Osprey that they unveiled just last year, and that one had 433 qubits, which is way, way smaller than these big four-digit numbers. Yeah, it's surprising how quickly we've gone to two different computers with a thousand qubits. As you say, it was very recently that we only were talking hundreds of qubits. So Condor's thing is that it's large, and that could also make it more computationally powerful. What about Heron? What's its trick? Right. So so here's the sort of second fundamental thing about quantum computers that, that we have to talk about, and that is that they actually make a ton of errors. So in theory, quantum computers are these incredibly powerful machines that should be able to solve problems that are completely out of reach, even for the best conventional supercomputers. But in practice, all the quantum computers we've built, and especially the ones that are getting larger and larger, become less trustworthy, become error prone. So the more qubits you have, the more errors they make, and then you've got a real problem with how to use the device. So IBM's team took a detour from all of their past quantum computers and basically redesigned Heron from the ground up to make it have much smaller error rates than than any of their other devices in their sort of quantum computer flock. One researcher told me that it actually does five times better than than their previous state-of-the-art device. All right, so we've got Condor that has many qubits and Heron, which has qubits that are good at not making mistakes. So this sounds like a best of both worlds quantum computer is still missing. Uh, There's the American meme that goes, por que no los dos? You know, why can't we have both? Yeah, I mean, you you basically just identified something that I think has been keeping up many quantum computing researchers at night losing sleep over how you get to both of these things at once. And had we had these conversations a few years ago, I would have told you that making it past a thousand qubits is like an incredible feat of quantum engineering. But the industry has really progressed so much that simply going bigger is really not enough. When I visited IBM Labs here in New York State to see Heron and Condor, most of the conversations I had with researchers were about tweaking small engineering details that could make these large numbers of qubits actually useful. It was conversations about wires that connected the chips that then control the qubits or the hardware that lets qubits talk to each other, like really nitty gritty engineering stuff that ensures that when the next generation of even bigger chips comes around, it's not just outputting noise. Like this is really a mature technology now where we can have these conversations of like, is the wire good enough and not just is the chip big enough? And this is why Condor and Heron were unveiled together. Condor pushed the number of qubits forward, but IBM are really banking on researchers extensively using the more reliable Heron to learn lessons for both how to make and use future chips. So can we assume that 
you know, these quantum computers will at least continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger? Yeah, I mean, if they're going to make a real difference in, in industries like pharmaceuticals or aviation or chemistry, they basically have to get bigger and bigger and bigger. IBM is planning on building a 2,000 qubit machine by 2023. Atom Computing is saying that they will have at least 1,225 qubits by the end of the next year, so bigger than the one that they have already, which is now a record holder. And we're also seeing advances in dealing with the errors that will almost certainly plague all of these large quantum computers. IBM, on their part, is pushing on improving the hardware and also coming up with new algorithms for error correction. And just this week, there was a team at Harvard that broke a record for most qubits that can run error-corrected programs. Their computer only had 280 physical qubits, but could be a real contender when it comes to making quantum computers whose output we can actually trust to be free of errors. Before you go, I've got to ask the important <laughs> question. We've had Condor, Heron, Osprey. Where's this going? Have we got ostrich next, resplendent quetzal? Like, which bird is next down the line? Yeah, I mean, so in the next few years, down the line, we've got flamingo, starling, and kakabura. But the biggest one, the 2,000 qubit one, I believe will be called blue jay, which is very quaint for a machine that's bound to be very powerful. I mean, blue jays can... Sorry, this is a really fun blue jay fact you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Blue Jays can mimic red-tailed hawks, which does make them very cool. So. I mean, okay, we settled it. Blue Jays, Blue Jays for life. <laughs> <laughs> the first week of the COP28 climate summit wrapped up in Dubai this week. We've been hearing it could be the most important climate summit since the 2015 Paris Agreements on limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But even as business proceeds at a fast pace, complications also abound from a host nation that is firmly invested in fossil fuels to an underfunded cache of money for the low-income countries most damaged by climate disasters. Editor Jacob Aaron is here while our environment reporter James Deneen makes his way to Dubai for on-the-ground reporting. Jacob, how are we doing at COP this year? Well, it's the kind of week where we can point to some very specific wins, but each has a kind of caveat at the same time. A yes, but kind of conversation. <laughs> and let's start with that money for low income countries that you mentioned first. So James touched on this somewhat when he spoke with you last week. And it's what in climate speak is called loss and damage, a fund where rich countries that are more responsible for global warming emissions are paying in to help poorer, lower emitting countries adapt. Think island nations whose entire existences are at stake as sea levels rise, for example. This fund was created last year, but it awaited key agreements this year to actually put it into action, which we got surprisingly early in the summit. Countries such as the UAE, Germany, the US, and also the EU have all pledged more than 700 million collectively for this fund. The catch is that donations to the fund are entirely voluntary, and low-income countries have calculated that they need more than $100 billion to truly weather the climate crisis. So what about moves to reduce warming itself? James was telling us last week about pushes for more renewable energy and improvements to energy efficiency. What have we gotten there so far? There's good news. Uh, 120 countries have signed a pledge to triple their renewable energy and double their energy efficiency by the end of this decade. That's a truly significant step. The International Energy Agency calls this the single largest step needed to slash planet warming carbon emissions. However, there's that but again. Two of the world's highest emitters are India and China, and they've been sitting this pledge out, even though they are known to support tripling their renewables. China has become a world leader in building renewable energy capacities, so it's unclear why they're not signing on, except perhaps the energy efficiency targets may be less appealing for them to commit to, or the fact that both countries are dependent on coal. And this pledge also requires no new coal power to be built. All right, that all makes sense. And are we seeing any more aggressive moves for reducing fossil fuels, you know, further down the road? There's a group of countries that are pledging to stop using fossil fuels entirely, yes. Uh, it's called the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, and until this week it had about 14 members. That number is now expanded by three so far at this COP. Spain, Kenya and Samoa have joined. And Spain's climate minister said that none of the other pledges, tripling renewable energy capacity, doubling energy efficiency, will be worthwhile if countries do not also gradually phase out fossil fuels. Colombia, a fossil fuel producing country, has also joined an alliance pushing for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, committing countries to end new development of fossil fuel resources. I mean, that sounds pretty good. But this pattern we've been on during this segment, I'm feeling, what's the catch? 
Yes, yeah, but so there, there is a cache. This is all against a backdrop of thousands of people with close ties to the fossil fuel industry attending the summit, a larger group of delegates than any single country besides Brazil or the UAE has sent. And those delegates are negotiating pledges of their own. 50 companies, including ExxonMobil and Saudi Aramco, pledged last weekend to reach net zero on their operations by 2050 and to cut nearly all the methane emissions that leak from their operations by 2030. Methane is a huge greenhouse gas on its own, and cutting emissions of methane is widely seen as one of the cheapest and most effective ways to slow warming in the near future. Though obviously oil firms cutting net zero on their own operations ignores the actual emissions from their products. And finally, the COP president, Sultan Al-Jabbar, who is also an oil executive, has drawn fire this week for some remarks of his where he implied he did not believe there was a scientific consensus that a phase out of fossil fuels is necessary to meet the target of 1.5 degrees warming. Uh, there was a bit of a debate over whether he did say that and exactly what he meant, but it has put a colour on the whole event. All right, still much more to discuss. We'll uh, be following the final week of that next week. Back with more then. If you're hungry right about now... I know I am. Good news. We're going to make you even more hungry. The TV show Lessons in Chemistry has been highlighting some underappreciated food science. So for Culture Lab this week, we thought we'd bring you some of the tastiest food science we could find. Editor Sam Wong talks to Pia Sorensen about engineering the perfect cheese sauce, the chemistry of day-old pie crust, and how to harness helpful bacteria for delicious fermented foods. That's in your feed right now. Get it? Get it? I, is that a joke? I, I don't understand. And what goes better with food than uh, cannabis? We're continuing our special three-part series on the drug this Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Our reporting team has been working for months to uncover where weed came from, what we know about how it affects our brains and bodies, and how our relationship with this plant may change in the future. This episode is a journey through the brain. What happens when you take that first inhale and how chemicals like THC and CBD set off the reactions that they do? Cannabis, it turns out, is made of things that your brain and body already has a whole system for. What we're now learning about the endocannabinoid system can explain, for example, why so many people seem to find pot useful for chronic pain. And if you are still hungry for content, I mean, after that, we've got one more thing for you. The dramatic story of the doctors that fly to medical emergencies in the remote Australian outback. That's Tuesday. Normal podcast time, normal podcast place. Next up, a new development in the opioid overdose epidemic, which kills more than 150 people each day in the United States. Health reporter Grace Wade is here to talk about a new drug which could help protect people from overdosing on fentanyl, one of the most dangerous of the opioid drugs. Grace, welcome to the show. So what can you tell us about this new therapy? So researchers have developed an antibody treatment called CSX-1004, which blocks the effects of the opioid fentanyl. Antibodies are proteins that can destroy pathogens such as bacteria and viruses by binding to molecules on their surface. But instead of targeting disease-causing microbes, the antibodies in this new treatment were engineered to target fentanyl. That means these antibodies very quickly bind to fentanyl once it enters the body, preventing it from reaching the brain and causing an overdose. Fentanyl is incredibly lethal because even at low doses, it slows respiration, which decreases blood oxygen levels. I've not heard of an antibody treatment like quite like this before. Has it been tested yet? Do we know if it works? The medication hasn't been tested in humans yet, but it has been tested in non-human primates, and the results are quite promising. The researchers gave four spider monkeys a single IV infusion of the antibody, and it protected them for a month from the low respiratory rates you see with a fentanyl overdose. So after treatment, it took about 15 times more fentanyl on average to create the same decrease in respiration as it took before they were given the antibody. The medication also blunted the pain-relieving effects of fentanyl, suggesting it could treat addiction to the drug as well. The idea is that if you block the euphoric high produced by fentanyl, people will gradually stop using it since it doesn't do anything. So I just want to make sure I got this straight, Grace. You're saying that this medication, given once once a month maybe, could potentially help protect people from fentanyl overdose for that entire month as well as help them stop using the drug. Yes, which obviously could be really beneficial for people with opioid use disorder, but it could also reduce the risk of overdose in people addicted to other drugs, such as cocaine or methamphetamine, which are frequently contaminated with fentanyl. This sounds really, really promising. Like, all of this sounds good to me. But this is a result involving a trial with just four spider monkeys, right? So I have to ask, are there downsides 
could it not be as good as it sounds? Well, first, we need to know how the antibody works in humans, kind of like you implied there. Clinical trials are currently underway to answer that question. The experts I spoke with, though, aren't too concerned about the results translating to people because the treatment already uses human antibodies. They also didn't find any negative side effects of it in the animals. However, one really important caveat is that it doesn't work against other opioids like heroin or oxycodone, since the structures of these molecules differ significantly from fentanyl. It's also possible that illicit drug manufacturers will develop a new substance that won't be targeted by this treatment. So while this medication really does have tremendous potential, it definitely won't solve the opioid crisis. It will just be another tool in our belt. But it's still a really powerful tool, so long as it works in humans and makes it through the necessary regulatory hoops. All right, editor Sam Wong is here with a story about birds and us about how a bird called a honey guide has a unique partnership with humans that's even more unique than we originally thought. Hey there, Sam. Hey. So tell us about honey guides, for starters. Yeah, honey guides are these really cool birds. They live in sub-Saharan Africa, and they're called honey guides because of this amazing behavior. They literally guide people to honey. So they fly near people, they make a chattering sound to attract their attention, and then they fly over to a bee's nest, and then the people follow, and the people then break open the nest and get the honey. And while the, the people collect the honey, then the birds will eat the wax and the larvae. So yeah, it's this amazing partnership. Uh, they also have a really good Latin name, which is Indicator Indicator. No, I love a good bird name, Sam. And that's such a smart symbiosis. I really have to wonder, though, how do these honey guide birds learn how to do this partnership with us in the first place? It's all the more remarkable because honey guides are brood parasites like cuckoos. So the females lay their eggs in the nests of other birds and the chicks never meet their parents. So, so the guiding behavior must just be in their genes. But they also learn to respond to these specific sounds made by humans. So honey hunters in different parts of Africa they use special calls to like signal to the birds, signal that they're looking for a honey guide and to keep up the, the contact while they're following the bird. So we've got some clips of uh, some of these sounds. Here's one from the Yao people who live in Malawi and Mozambique. So you can hear the bird making that squeaky chattering sound and um, the people are going, brrrr. Huh? So that's the Yao people. Uh, and then here's another one from the Hadza people who live in northern Tanzania. And it's really different. It's a more kind of whistling sound. Yeah, those, those sounds really are so different. It's strange that they're doing, they're the, communicating the same thing. Why are they so different? Do we know anything about that? Well, they're, they're different cultures with different languages, but there's a kind of interesting explanation about why each group has the sounds that they do. So the um, Hadza people, they, they while they're foraging for honey, they're also hunting small animals and they don't want to scare them away. So they use this whistling sound that's more like a bird noise and not recognizably mm -hmm. human. Whereas the Hadza people, they don't hunt while they're foraging for honey, but they use this more human-like sound, which might help to ward off uh, dangerous animals like buffalo or lions. And do we know that the birds can actually recognize both these sorts of sounds? Yeah. So the study we reported on this week looked into this. Some scientists went out with the, uh, the honey hunters in these two cultures, and they played back sounds by the two different cultures in both places. And the birds were three times more likely to respond to the signals made by the local honey hunters in their area than the ones made by the other group. So it does seem that the birds learn the local signals. It's not like they, they innately know which signals to respond to. They learn what the humans make in their area. And there's a kind of cultural co-evolution going on with their specific groups. Is there any issues with other animals picking up on these signals too? You know, turn, also thinking they might get some honey perhaps. Ooh, so I don't know if um, they've looked at whether other animals recognize these sounds. There are stories about honey guides cooperating with other animals besides humans, particularly honey badgers. But earlier this year, there was a study looking into this, and there's actually no reliable accounts of it in the scientific literature. 
But the researchers also interviewed honey hunters in 11 communities. And some of them, particularly the ones in Tanzania, did say that they had seen the two species interact and they think they cooperate. There's also a clip you can find online from an old nature documentary that appears to show a honey guide guiding a honey badger. But uh, apparently the narration and editing on that might have been a bit uh, misleading. So uh, maybe, yeah, maybe the two animals work together, but we're not quite sure about that yet. I'm not sure how we've left this one so late in the show, Christy, but there is a new species of hedgehog. I would slam my hand down on this table if it wouldn't set the mics off resonating (laughs) weird. There is a new hedgehog? Yeah, it is hot off the presses. It's a small, short-spined hedgehog that lives in forests in eastern China, and it's called Mesokinus orientalis. But researchers, they first suspected this species might be different from other known hedgehogs as far back as 2018, when the researchers stumbled on some hedgehogs in a part of China that hadn't been known to have any before. And there are four previously known species of forest hedgehog, and they live in northern China, Mongolia and Russia, as well as one population in southwestern China. But then it took a couple of years of gathering samples of this new one and analysing DNA and other features of these hedgehogs in eastern China to actually officially declare that it was a new species to science. And if you look at it, it's got very distinctive morphology in its skull and is smaller than the other closely related species in its genus. And if you think of the the common European hedgehogs that you've maybe seen pictures of or interacted with, Orientalis, it has darker brown fur and spines and slightly larger ears. I will say, having looked at pictures, that like all hedgehogs, it is very cute. Yeah. So how big a deal is it, though, that there's a new species in the pantheon of hedgehogs? Certainly there is excitement. And partly that's because we only knew of 17 total species of hedgehogs before. And now this brings that number up to 18. But there's also hope that maybe there's even more species out there. Like most hedgehogs, Mesokinus orientalis is nocturnal and it hibernates during the winter months. So that makes them quite difficult to find. All right, Tim, you've got the new hedgehog, but I want to tell you about a new robot. Is it a cute robot? Well, it's hard to say because these ones are very, very... Very small. They're nanorobots, about Mm. 100 nanometers across, and they're made of DNA. And they could be used to make drugs or chemicals like insulin inside our bodies, for example, or other medical uses. Okay, cute, maybe, but useful, definitely. How do these nanorobots, how do they actually work? Yeah, so basically the DNA that makes up these robots, it's carefully designed to create a 3D structure. And so that structure could work as like a little machine inside your cell, turning materials in your body into insulin or folding proteins to create enzymes that your own DNA isn't sort of shaped right to make because you lack a gene or something like that. So it's the same origami method that has been used for the past 20 years to create images or fold two-dimensional DNA shapes into 3D structures. But now this team has made 3D versions that come directly from scratch, which is both easier and also more reliable than, you know, having to take a 2D structure and make it 3D. Plus, because they're made from DNA, these robots can self-replicate under carefully controlled lab conditions at an exponential rate, making them really easy to make more of on an as-needed basis. Wow, that uh, sounds like the start of a novel, that the rise of the nanobots. <laughs> uh, okay, knock, knock. Who's there? Uh, brain regions. Brain regions, who? Brain regions that help you get a joke include the dorsal and ventral striatum. Tim. <laughs> Tim, how did you how did you even begin to think this was a good joke? Yeah, uh, not my best, I will admit that. But the joke was bad in many ways on purpose. And that's my defense. I did this on purpose. Your Honor. Yeah, okay, all right. And that's because there are two parts to how we process jokes. First, we have to understand it, which you did perfectly. You have to understand the joke from premise to punchline. But we also have to appreciate the joke if we're going to feel, you know, the mirth and start laughing, which you notably in this case did not. Correct. I did not appreciate the joke. But I do take it that you're setting me up to talk about some new research that is helping pin down both of those processes that you just talked about, the appreciation component and the comprehension component. 
Yeah, exactly. So previously, it was thought that most of getting a joke happened in the brain region called the cortex. That's the outer part of the brain that we associate with a lot of our higher order thinking. But a team wanted to see if it was possible that a deeper brain region called the striatum might also be involved. And so they sat a bunch of volunteers down to watch episodes of Seinfeld in <laughs> order to figure out if the striatum was also key to us getting a joke. Best research job ever, <laughs> or worse, depending on how you feel about it. Okay, so you mentioned comprehension, but also enjoyment as two very different parts of getting this joke. Did these end up happening in different regions of the brain? They did. So in two different parts of the same region, in fact. So the striatum has a dorsal or top part and a ventral or bottom part, and comprehension seems to happen in both parts. The involvement of the dorsal striatum makes a lot of sense. It's this region of the brain that helps us process ambiguity, which is obviously a key part of mm. humor. Mm -hmm. But the enjoyment part seems to happen only in the ventral or bottom part of the striatum, and that's a region that's associated with reward processing and enjoyment. So that's what lights up when you actually enjoy the joke that you've just figured out, not that you just understand it. Or it's also where that frustration could come from if someone's told you an appalling joke or you don't really understand it. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. You can find all the stories we talked about today in the show notes, and you can subscribe to this podcast on whichever app you're currently listening on. Plus, if you really enjoy the great stories we're bringing you, please give us a rating or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We love talking about this stuff, and we love hearing your thoughts about it too. We'll be back next week as usual. Bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.